This is Duke University. Uh, I am Linda Burton. I'm the current director of the Center for Child and Family Policy here at Duke and at the School of Public Policy. On behalf of the Center for Family Policy here, I would like to welcome you to the Salzberger Distinguished Lecture Series. The Center for Child and Family Policy sponsors the Salzberger's Distinguished Lecture Series to stimulate the intellectual community, not only for its own faculty, research scientists and staff, but also for Duke University broadly, Durham and as well as the entire region. The series brings world-renowned experts to Duke and Durham who have demonstrated unrivaled excellence in behavioral science and theory, as well as science to policy applications. The lecture series, which began in 2006, is endowed by the author Salzburg family. Please join us afterwards for a reception in the first floor lobby. We're still doing first floor uh, this time? First floor? First floor. So uh, please take a moment to silence your cell phones as I tell you a little bit more about Secretary Mandy Cohen. Secretary Cohen is North Carolina's Secretary of Health and Human Services, where she leads one of North Carolina's largest department with nearly 16,000 employees. The state agency covers public health, mental health, social services, and early childhood education, and more. Secretary Cohen is an internal medicine physician and has experience leading complex health organizations. Before coming to North Carolina DHHS, she was the Chief Operating Officer and Chief of Staff at the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. She brings a deep understanding of health care to the state and has been responsible for implementing policies for Medicare, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, and the federal marketplace. A graduate of Cornell University, Secretary Cohen received her medical degree from, from Yale School of Medicine, a master's in public health from the Harvard School of Public Health, and trained in internal medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. Among her top priorities are combating the opioid crisis, building a strong, efficient Medicaid program, and improving early childhood education. Let us please welcome Secretary Mandy Cohn. Good afternoon. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Um, really an honor and somewhat intimidating. The brain power in this room um, around early childhood is uh, incredible. I'm looking at some of the authors of the work that has really influenced a lot of what we're already doing at the department and some of what I'm going to talk about about what we're going to do in the future. Um, before I dive into all things early childhood, I thought I would I'd share a story that I, I share, I've been sharing a lot as I, as I give talks and I meet folks around the state. And it, it's not related to, to children yet, but I think helps you understand where I come from in terms of my thinking about being the Secretary of, of Health and Human Services um, and how I think about health for the, for the state. So um, as mentioned, so I'm a primary care doctor by training. And when I was just about done with my training at Mass, Mass General up in, in, in Boston, I was in my, my last year, actually in my last few months of training, um, I met a 24-year-old woman who was a full-time college student. She had commercial insurance. She had Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts insurance. Uh, and she came into my primary care clinic with sort of something that I bet some of us have gone in there. She was, she was feeling tired. She was losing weight and she was losing her hair. 
uh, sort of a vague, vague complaints. And I, but I was, you know, I was almost done training. I was, I've got that. I, I went to Yale and Harvard, right? Uh, so I was like, I, I know what to do. And I asked her, you know, some very personal questions that your doctor usually asks you that you don't talk about at parties about menstrual periods and about diarrhea and family history um, of other medical illnesses. Um, and I do an exam, and then I do what doctors often do best. Uh, I ordered lab tests. I, um, and luckily all of those came back normal. Uh, about four weeks into knowing her, she's coming back. She's still having these symptoms. I examine her again. Now maybe she's having some belly pain, not sure. So I actually order some imaging studies. I actually CAT scan her belly, thinking maybe there's something there that I missed that the lab test didn't show. I thought about thyroid issues, I thought about anemia, I thought about Lyme disease, I thought about, uh, once I was scanning her belly, I started thinking about cancers. So I'm, I'm seeing her for the third time. I'm, I've known her now for eight weeks. Um, and now I'm talking to my, my mentor, my preceptor, right, because I'm still training. Uh, and I'm, I'm saying, hey, I ordered these lab tests, I ordered these imaging, what should I do next? And we're essentially sort of standing outside the, the doorway talking about her case and saying, I think the next thing we're going to do is send her to a specialist. And we're trying to think, well, what specialist? Do we think rheumatology or endocrinology? Where do we think we go here? And when my medical tech who checked in the patient um, comes by and sort of gives us you know, that, that piece of paper with her blood pressure and her pulse and all that, and she says, you know, I really think you need to ask the patient if she has enough to eat. Ugh, eight weeks. Eight weeks, and I went to Harvard and Yale, and I didn't ask my patient a very important question about her health, um, which was, you know, did she have enough to eat? And eight weeks, she went hungry, because I didn't ask her about whether or not she had enough to eat. And it, makes me so emotional as I think about it. Um, because, you know, I was doing what I thought, you know, what I had been trained to do in like the most elite institution in this country at Mass General to order those lab tests and to like go down my differential diagnoses. Um, but I hadn't asked her if she had enough to eat. And you know why? It was because I wasn't at my community health center clinic, right? I was in my nice women's health center clinic and she didn't look like someone who didn't have enough to eat. She was perfectly put together. She never led on that she could have had some chaos going on in her personal life. It didn't even occur to me. And so as I went back in the room to think about how after eight weeks could I muster what I was going to ask her, um, I, was, I was very embarrassed that I, that I was just coming to this, this realization. My med tech clearly, clearly had, had had some interaction with her when she was checking in where, where this had come to light, so we knew, I knew it was going to be on her mind. But I was also thinking about the four patients I had in my waiting room uh, to say, well, what if she said, I don't have enough to eat? What was I going to do? My clinic wasn't even set up to deal with that. Um, but I went in, I, I asked her, well, what, what's going on at home, right? And uh, that was enough, luckily, for her to sort of open up and share what was going on with her life. Again, she's a full-time college student. She had commercial insurance, but just uh, two, three months back, she left an abusive relationship. She was living out of her car. She was eating lunch at school, and she was too embarrassed to call her mom because her mom really liked the boyfriend uh, that she was dating, right? And she just didn't know how to reach out for help. And she even had her own the cognitive dissonance about what was going on with her physically and, the, and, and how that connected to what was going, going on with her. And luckily, she was a bright girl. We were, as soon as we were able to you know, get to the root of what was actually going on there, we were able to get her the help that she needed and get her back um, in, into a, a stable place with some temporary help that within you know, six months she even no longer needed. So I, I share that story, one, to show that um, you know, even when you're, I think I was a pretty good doctor, that if you're not thinking broadly about health, that you can miss really things that are right in front of you. And that when, when I think about what I'm charged now to do for the state of North Carolina, which is thinking about the health and well-being of this entire state, which is something that keeps you up at night, um, I really think broadly about, about health. And what are we using our dollars, right? I mentioned we have a 
$20 billion a year budget at the state, which is a lot uh, to spend. And are we really buying health um, for, for our state um, as we move forward? And as I think about early childhood, the investment made in early childhood health and education, that I think that there is no more important time to think broadly about that health, that well-being, that development for someone's long-term health, their ability to overall be uh, successful in life. And so I shared that story mostly to help you understand how I think about, frankly, every decision that we make in the department, again, with the lens of are we using all of our resources and getting the most value out of all of the dollars that we're, we're spending, um, and, and thinking through why it's so important to invest in kids exactly for that point. Right, exactly if we're thinking about where do we want to put our resources to make sure that we have a state that is the healthiest. So with that, let me go through a lot of data, which some of you, like this is your, the, the air you breathe, this data. So but let me go through some of it um, and then want to talk about what we are trying to do with the department. And then I look forward to um, questions and dialogue. So I've, I've been sharing this statistic here about infant mortality. I feel like you can't start talking about early childhood and whether or not you talk about can, are children being born here and making it to their first birthday. So infant mortality rate is just a measure of how many babies make it to their first birthday. And so when it's, we say North Carolina has an infant mortality rate of 7.3, that means 7.3 babies out of 1,000 are dying before their first birthday. So that's, that is a higher than the national average, which is 5.8. But what's really important about that statistic, and I break it apart here, is that, that it's more than meets the eye if you just took it at your, its face of a statewide number. You really have to break it apart. And so when you look at infant mortality rate based on race, if you're lucky enough to be born white here, you have an infant mortality rate of closer to five, if you're born African American here, it's closer to 13. And if you live in one of the rural eastern or western counties in North Carolina, it's nearly 20. And when you take away genetic factors from what keeps a child from making it to their first birthday, we know that the factors that drive infant mortality are really a lot more related to mom than they are to baby. They're related to mom's overall health, access to prenatal care for her, and then just overall poverty. But again, that's related to mom. And I just, before I move on, just to tell, share with you my concern about these statistics, when you compare what it is like to live in rural western or eastern part of our state and have that infant mortality rate, that is on par with Syria, with Nicaragua. Right? That's what we're talking about. Uh, here in, in North Carolina, and it is certainly a troubling statistic, but when I break it apart, it's a very complex statistic. A lot of things, like I said, make that up, but when you break it apart, say, okay, well, how are we doing on mom's overall health? And we look at, at our national ranking of where we are for women's overall health. We rank, we're not just average, we're not below average, we're, we're nearly at the bottom of the pack for some of these statistics. For mom's overall health, overall women's health, we rank 39th out of 50. This is a staggering statistic. For women who are experiencing violence, almost half of women in North Carolina have experienced some sort of intimate partner violence. That ranks us 47th out of 50, that is shocking. Women are obese, we're doing a bit better about smoking in pregnancy. We know that 55% of births are unintended, that ranks us 34th, 20% of women uninsured, 38th, 7% are born with no prenatal care, that ranks us 28th, and then poverty statistics. We have some of the worst poverty statistics related to children in particular, where we know that 25% of kids, zero to five, are food insecure, that ranks us 49th out of 50. That is not buying health, right? So knowing that, we know that we need to, in, to think differently. And I'm going to talk specifically about early childhood health and education. But I think the three priorities that we have for the department really try to get at this concept of buying health. We have, I have a lot of work in our Medicaid program and transformation that I'll talk about, work around opioid crisis, and then a huge bucket of work around early childhood health and education. 
So I'm going to share something that I know most of the folks in this room know about the fact that early childhood development is really, really important. That zero to five time frame is sort of foundational. I think that is, that is well known, frankly, by some of the research of people in this room. Thank you very much. Um, and we know that it's also not determinative. It just doesn't mean that you're, you're born with the genetic map that you have and, you know, that's it, right? We know that there is a dynamic process here that's going on, and this is sort of a pictorial. I like pictures. So for me, thinking about um, brain development is really important. We know that early time uh, in life is so important to synapse formation, like all the ways in which our, our neurons are connecting to each other. So you can see even in gestation, and then look, three, six, six months, two years, we're just building connections, building connections, and that's from interacting with other people. It's that face-to-face -face interaction, it's that la hearing language, it's seeing faces and all of that is building those neural, uh, the, those synapse formation. And then as they get older, four years, six years, then, it's maturing those, those synapse formation over time. And so that is such a critical, critical time. And we also know that when the brain experiences some sort of trauma or toxic stress, it literally changes the way in which your brain chemistry works. It changes the way in which your neurons connect to each other permanently. Um, so we know, you can see the normal picture there of, of, of how neurons typically interact when, when someone experiences toxic stress, whether as a child or an adult, you get a damage to that. And I'll, I'll just, as a, an aside, as we are look, learning more and more about opioids and how um, its impact on the brain, it is actually changing also the, the way our neurons interact with each other in the opioid crisis. It's almost, it is simulating a lot of that toxic stress. And so when I think about when children are experiencing trauma or adverse events, uh, that is really significant to me, particularly as someone who's thinking, again, about a lifelong health, lifelong learning, lifelong productivity. When someone is experiencing adverse childhood events, I think that's really significant. Um, so an adverse childhood event, again, telling this audience feels uh, things you, you already know, but it's anything from divorce to a parent with substance abuse to actually um, uh, physical or emotional uh, ab abuse directly. It's food insecurity. There's sort of a standard set of questions uh, that, that folks are asked. And North Carolina ranks 30th in terms of our prevalence of adverse childhood events, where about uh, one in four kids are experiencing two or more of these sort of traumatic uh, experiences. And we know the more uh, the more adverse uh, experiences that you're experiencing as a child, we know that that is actually having, again, lifelong impact on someone's overall health. If I think about that, the bottom of the pyramid of these adverse childhood events, and again, it changes your neurochemistry. It changes the way in which your body releases cortisol and for how long it releases cortisol. It literally reshapes how your um, your arteries are, are in your body, which again, changes the way in which your body responds to things um, and changes your uh, lifelong risks of chronic disease. So I'll, I'll tell you about, again, back to where I trained up in Boston at Mass General. They did a really interesting study at the clinic um, for adults who are awaiting bariatric surgery, right? So very obese, awaiting surgery. They administered this adverse childhood event survey to, to folks and asked everyone um, how many adverse childhood events have you had. And it was shocking to me to learn that 80% of those who are awaiting bariatric surgery had three or more adverse childhood events, three or more, right? And so I, the primary care doctor, that's all I do, hypertension, diabetes, uh, obesity, like those are the, those are the things that I treat every day in my clinic. I had never, I, I had, never had as part of my, my thinking to start to really dig down on some of those early childhood experiences and what that has really reshaped someone. But it makes me think very differently about obesity when 80% when of folks are screening positive for three or more adverse childhood events. That link there between experience and how your body reacts is, is really powerful. We also know, and again, this is from 
information from right here at, at, at Duke that early learning experiences predict later success. I think that is why North Carolina has a history of long, uh, uh, of, of investing early uh, in, in childhood, in, in early childhood education, and it's been really successful. Um, we know that learning is rooted in early brain development. Uh, we know that unfortunately only 38% of North Carolinian fourth graders and 25% of students from disadvantaged families score at or above reading prof proficiency. We, so clearly that link between economics and, uh, and reading attainment is, is real. We know that reading in the early grades also predicts how you're going to do overall in high school. And so it was here at Duke that showed that return on investment uh, in early childhood services that has shown uh, that, that has really been the foundation of how we invest in early childhood education uh, overall. So how are we doing with children's health and well-being here in North Carolina? Uh, we could do better. We could do better. And I want to talk about how I want to. Uh, and how we're trying to put together a coordinated plan to, to do well. So some of these are, are about health, but, and some of these are um, about the factors that influence their well-being, but ultimately your educational attainment, right? You can't come to school hungry and expect to, to learn well. I, I want to commend, it was a Duke study that just came out about the timing of SNAP benefits and overall um, and, and, and uh, scores uh, in, on your test. I thought that was an incredibly important and groundbreaking study that I'm starting to talk about wherever I can. I mean, I think it shows the direct relationship between food and academic performance um, and, and how interlinked that they are. So back to this. Congratulations, Duke. Well done, <laughs> well done uh, on really good research, well-timed, so important to the national conversation that's going on right now. So children's overall health ranking, we rank 31st, right? So actually that is better than some of our, our other statistics. Um, and you can see North Carolina has made a big investment in, in children and early childhood education. 62% of kids are uh, proficient by end of third grade reading. We, that ranks us 15th. Out of, out of 50, you will know that that is an aberration of the, the other uh, um, uh, rankings for us. And I think that's good. It shows that there's been an investment and we can move the needle when we all make a, a concerted investment here. And I, I thank the members of the General Assembly who were part of that, of that in, uh, investment. But we also know that young kids are, are not in school settings. 50% of them are, are not in school settings. Uh, we know that still kids are uninsured despite the fact that there's Medicaid and CHIP are out there. 10% of kids are still uninsured. Uh, too many kids live in poverty. Too many kids are in, uh, food insecure. Um, and then we have an increase in our foster care system, a lot related to the opioid crisis. Um, and then uh, another 70,000 kids uh, are, come through our child protective services as well. So that's just where we are by the numbers. So let me talk about then our department. I think many of you know um, that our department uh, reaches the lives of young children in so many ways, and it's really um, in incredible. So whether it's in this domain of health that I've been thinking about or safety or, or developmental education, we know that in Medicaid, for example, we pay for half the births in the state. We pay for home visiting work. We run the WIC program or the SNAP program uh, or the CC4C, the, the care coordination for, for children program. Uh, we run and we oversee child protective services and foster care and adoption. We uh, administer the child care subsidy work we, uh, and, and NC Pre-K and Smart Start. We uh, do the child star ratings for um, our child care facilities. So tons of ways in which the department touches the lives of kids. And you know, when I joined the department a little over a year ago, I definitely saw an opportunity for improvement on how we at the department do our work. I think everyone is off doing really good work trying to help families and children and communities in their, their silos. But this is a team sport. It's a team sport, and we have to think strategically about our resources because we have to be good stewards of them. Um, and so we have been really thinking about how do we work differently at the department? How do we work more in a more coordinated way internally so that when we actually go out to help the children and families, we are, are the, the most coordinated we possibly can be so that we can help an individual family. And right now, I don't think that's, that is the way that we currently interact with, with, with most folks. 
Um, so just to tell you about the scope of our reach, it's incredible, as I mentioned. So we know that there's about 600,000 kids who are zero to five in, in North Carolina. As I mentioned, 54% of the births paid for by Medicaid, 172,000 of those are served by WIC, another 110,000 through, served through SNAP, 183,000 um, are in licensed childcare programs, 28,000 in pre-K, 40,000 in receiving childcare subsidies, and then another 4,300 in foster, foster care kids. So our department has an incredible reach, um, and that means an incredible responsibility to children. Um, so let me talk about how I'm hoping that we can continue to improve the work that we are, are doing going forward. So the first is, like I said, that we have to work differently and, and more collaboratively just internally. Um, and so we wanted to put a specific spotlight on early childhood, bring together our public health, our mental health, Medicaid, uh, the work in, in economic services, in child protective services, and everyone sit in the same room. And I'm sorry to say that um, you know, before I joined, a lot of my folks at the department had never even met each other. And that's not, that's not good. Uh, so that's, that's, that's over. Uh, so we've all met each other. <laughs> uh, so we've all met each other. And I think folks are really excited. I don't think it was for malicious reasons they hadn't met each other. We, it, was, it was a structural, both a structural problem and a cultural problem that we're overcoming. But we've also been able to come together to say, well, how do we want to be different? And so we've come up with these three domains. And again, it's an organizing structure for us, but I hope it will, will translate into a partnership uh, externally as well. So I, I'm a big, you know, also have to prioritize. So you only get three buckets. So it's keep kids healthy, keep kids safe and secure, and promote children's learning and development. So that's what, what I'm going to be talking through. So first on the health bucket, this sort of goes back to my, uh, are we buying health for our kids out there? We, I mentioned all of where we are on our rankings, and we know we need to do, to do better. And I, with the Medicaid program, we have a very big tool, right? If I have a $20 billion budget, 13 of those billion dollars go towards the health care budget or to the Medicaid program. Those are not all state dollars. Those are mostly federal dollars. Um, but, we, but thinking about how do we use Medicaid to really drive better health in kids. Um, and so this is where that mismatch in spending that I was talking about with my patient, where, where my budget, if you look at the budget of the department, is, is really directed at, at what happens in the four walls of a doctor's office or a hospital. But if you think about your own health, your kid's health, it's really what's on this left-hand side of the, of the, of the um, slide here. What drives your health, right? If you think about what drives your own health, it's prob your, your first image is probably not your primary care doctor, though I'd want it to be <laughs> as a primary care doctor. It's probably not your first thought when you're like, what keeps me healthy? It's not your primary care doctor. It's probably, hey, did I make it to the gym this week? Or did I go for, did I, you know, choose to have dessert last night, or maybe I went for pizza instead of that salad at lunch, right? It's a lot of the choices we make about our own health. Did, you know, am I a smoker? Um, did I, uh, you know, make decisions about my, my own health and those behavioral patterns? We know some of it's genetic. Some of us are, you know, you're born with the, the, some genetic blueprint. We also know, though, a lot of it is social circumstance, um, and whether it's transportation or housing or food, as we've been talking about. We also know it's about the air we breathe and the water we drink. I've certainly been spending a lot of time learning about the water here in North Carolina um, and how that impacts uh, someone, someone's health. And then there's health care, right? I, I spent my career training to be a doctor, and I think it's incredibly important. And we're sitting um, at a place where there's just an incredible resource of health of, of, of healthcare at both at Duke and UNC and other places across the state. We have fantastic institutions uh, that provide great health care. So all of that makes up what, what drives our health. But like I said, the dollars, the dollars are directed really to the four walls of hospitals and clinics. Um, but I think we need to think more broadly about it. And we do have a, a vision at, North, uh, at the department about this overall. And it's not just for kids, but I think it's really important when we think about kids. It's to optimize health and well-being for all people by effectively stewarding resources that bridge communities and our healthcare system. 
You can see in there, this is about stewarding resources. It's not about net new. I think we should all recognize that resources are tight, that we need to, as, as I said, particularly when I'm thinking about taxpayer dollars, really need to be in good stewards of those resources. And how, this is not about net new, but really about knitting together what we already do. It, it's the same concept that I'm trying to do at my department, again, which is put us all in the same room and think about how do we leverage each other's resources. This is about how do we think about bridging the communities and the healthcare system to really drive better outcomes for, for, for folks. So my biggest tool to do that is through the Medicaid program. And so you probably know that we are about to change the way in which Medicaid is operated next year. Um, we are going to go from a state-administered program where the state pays the bills to an insurance company-administered program where insurance companies will pay the bills. And I think it is an opportunity for our state in that transition to think differently about what do we pay for? What, what value do we want to get out of our dollars? And so we have a lot of really good infrastructure here that we're able to base it on. But the two takeaways here, and I'm going to get back to kids, I promise, but most of the folks in our Medicaid program are kids. 70% uh, uh, of the people on Medicaid are children. Um, and so I think this transformation is really going to be important for them. So what first is we're thinking about is making sure we focus on the whole person or the whole child. Right now, for a child here in North Carolina, they have two insurance cards, one for their physical health and one for their mental health. It gets paid for separately. And when you pay for things separately, you get delivery of care separately. It's just a structural, unfortunate reinforcement. And so we want to uh, bring back together physical and mental health as we move forward in this transformation. Just like you, if you look in your, your wallet right now, you have one insurance card. I want everyone in our Medicaid program to have one insurance card. And again, that drives different thinking about how to invest in, a whole, in the whole person. Um, so we're very close on, on making sure that we have the authorizing legislation to move forward. But literally, nearly every state in the country is moving in this direction. I think folks are recognizing the importance of linking physical and mental health. So um, there's a lot of work. And then there's, there's work I'm, I'm, I'll share more about, about meeting those unmet social needs, the food, the housing, the transportation, because that has to be a component of how we're thinking about a whole person. Then the second bucket of work is around driving towards value. And this is, again, you have to marry up the, thing, the, the outcomes you want with what you pay for. Right, right now, I think, it, I think we get exactly what we pay for in healthcare. We pay for doctor's visits. We pay for hospitalizations. We pay for you to go to the emergency room. And so you get what you pay for. And what we need to do is change the way in which we pay to drive that change. So we have a lot of work, and I won't go through all of the details, about how do we think about investing differently and paying differently. So moving to alternative payment models, this is my, my background and some of the work I did when I was wearing a Medicare hat back at the federal level. Um, and how do we think, again, about investing in primary care to make sure that folks, again, are getting the resources they need. They don't get necessarily more lab tests and imaging tests like I, I did, that they actually get what is at the root of what will drive better health for them. So as part of that, this, the, we are investing in a few different ways across the state. First, I'm excited, and I'll show you some maps in a second. Ju tomorrow, we will put out an announcement um, about a new map that we are going to put out across the state. So down to the zip code level, you are going to be able to see sort of different factors that might influence someone's health. Everything from do you have access to a car? Uh, to food deserts and is there access to food and see what that looks like and overlay and you can compare your census track. It's all census data and USDA data and you can compare census tracks. And I think it will really help us prioritize where to invest new resources. So as, as I can imagine county managers and county commissioners coming together to look at a map and say, okay, we, if we have a little bit of, of money and we want to think about a transportation resource in my community. Well, where, where is the highest need and how do we match what, what resources we have with those high needs? So I'll show you more on the map. So that's gonna be, um, it's already live, you can go there, but it's gonna be a, you know, a big push uh, uh, in the press and such tomorrow. So I'm excited about that. Second is that we have been working on a standardized way of asking questions about, about food and housing. Um, so right now we have out for comment eight questions 
uh, related to housing, food, transportation, interpersonal violence that we hope to bring to uh, the state of North Carolina. This is not just for the Medicaid program. I hope it's used, we have Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, participating in our, our working group because you need to ask folks with insurance also about those things because it makes up their health, right? Remember my patient, she had commercial insurance and I didn't ask her the question. And so, and so we need to do it and we need to do it in a standardized way so we know how to invest. Um, another piece that we are working on with, uh, with um, a bunch of, of uh, uh, private partners is to build a resource platform. Once you ask about food, like are you running out of food at the end of the month? you want to do something about it and navigate folks to those resources that exist in the community. And so we're thinking about a platform that not, not just tells you there's a resource available, but actually sends a message to say it's a food bank that, that's run by the church. You send that, the church food bank a message, hey, Mrs. Jones in my office needs your services. I'm sending her your way. They know she's coming. If she doesn't show up within a period of time, they'll kind of get back in touch with the practice to say she wasn't here and then you sort of can take the next next steps from there so that's exciting that is that is a you know a, a, a some time away before we're going to stand that up but um, hope to get started on that work actually pretty soon and then lastly as part of the medicaid program we're hoping to do some pilot um, pilots here in the state where we uh, use evidence interventions to think about how do we use our health care dollars differently i'll give you a really good kids example. So we know kids with asthma end up pretty with severe asthma, end up in the emergency room a lot, right? So what Cone Health did here in North Carolina was piloted intervention where instead of continuing just pay the emergency room, you know, dollars and, and up their medications, they went to their kids' homes, they ripped up their carpet and paid for new carpet and an air filter and then just look to see what happened. And it's not surprising that for those kids that got the new carpet and got the air filter, their emergency room use dramatically dropped, and thus their healthcare spending dramatically dropped. And so it's so rare where you can get that such a clear win uh, in healthcare where you have less spending, kids are healthy, mom and dad are at work instead of sitting in the emergency room with a kid, kids are back at school learning, we're spending less dollars, right? So when I say I want to use Medicaid dollars to buy carpet, which sounds crazy on its face, don't worry, Representative Horn, right? Uh, it, it, you know, but that, right, I want to spend on carpet, again, to get better outcomes to spend less money, and again, it's, it's about worker productivity as well, right? Mom and dad are, are at work instead of sitting in the emergency room. So those are the kinds of places where we want to think about interventions uh, that, that make sense. All right, so that's health, and that's a lot. Um, so second, let me spend some time talking about ki keeping kids safe and secure. Um, so this is in, in a space where we obviously oversee the child protective services work, and this is the interaction between the opioid crisis and what's going on in, with our, our communities, our children, and our families. Um, and then we have a, a, an opportunity with some new legislation to really rethink about how do we support the counties, which are the, the ones that are doing this hard work every day, how do we at the state support the counties in that, that work that they're, they're, they're doing. So let me, let me talk about, oh, sorry, I forgot. I'm going to talk about food first. So I've been talking about a lot about food, um, but I think you know that we run the SNAP program, the WIC program, and a children and adult food care program. And I just wanted to mention, this is back with the map that I mentioned. So if you look at Durham County, you'll be able on this map to look at Durham County and use this map to look at metrics like households with low access to grocery stores. And it's just comparing different communities to the other surrounding communities and that it'll map food deserts. So as we, you think about urban planning and again, investing new resources, it'll be an opportunity to do that. So sorry, before I transition to opioid crisis. So I, I don't wanna to spend too much time on opioids, but I think you know from picking up any newspaper every day that the opioid crisis is pretty severe here in North Carolina. Um, and there's some particular parts of the state that are hardest hit um, and uh, Wilmington being, being one of them. But we, we continue to see an up, upswing in the number of deaths 
Um, the deaths really are going up from heroin and fentanyl. They've moved on from prescription drugs, and the, the epidemic has really um, moved to illicit drugs um, where we're seeing the number of deaths. And so it is, it is really having a major impact on children and families as well. So we are seeing just a dramatic number of newborns being born exposed to uh, to opioids and having neonatal abstinence syndrome or NAS, um, where I've, I've toured now at least three NICUs in the state that have had to create a separate wing for NAS babies, babies who are, are exposed to opioids in utero, um, because they're so irritable, they cry so much, they actually disturb the other NICU babies, so you have to actually put them in a separate whole place, it's, it's pretty dramatic. Um, and so there, the, the in, we're, we're not even total, fully aware of what the long-term health impacts are of opioid crisis on these kids. So that is a place you're watching. And then as I mentioned, we're seeing more and more kids in foster care because of, because of this. We put together a, a huge opioid action plan we've been working on for almost a year now, um, which I won't go through in detail, but there's no one magic thing that we could do. It's a lot of things together. Um, oh, but I, I don't have the slide of the things that have, we've accomplished. So we've actually done a bunch, we've accomplished a bunch of things in this space. Um, but I will mention um, we have a, a, a request for proposal out right now to communities to uh, get some additional grant dollars from the state um, around, around opioids that is focused on, um, one aspect of it is focused on children and families. Then the last component, and then I will stop, and I'd love to just have a dialogue with the, with the rest of our time. Um, so we had health, we had safety, um, and then the last is promoting childhood learning and development. Um, and th this is where, again, we spent a lot of our, our focus making sure we have a well-funded and well-run pre-K program. Uh, we worked with the General Assembly to uh, increase the number of slots by 3,500 last year, which was exciting, and have uh, more coming this year. We continue to use our quality rating uh, system where we know that over 70% 70% of children are in four or five star uh, um, uh, child care uh, uh, facilities. That facility is the wrong word. Uh, and so, but there's more to do. So as I look forward to uh, our, our early childhood action plan, as I mentioned, I think this is a great way to organize all of us that are working in, in different spaces on this to say, okay, well, what, what are the core things that we're gonna focus on? And more importantly, like what are the metrics by which we're gonna hold ourselves accountable to know if we're making progress? So that's the work that we're doing right now. Um, and again, around the domains of health, safety, security, and learning. Um, and really thinking through measure, measurable targets. And then I talked with a number of faculty here uh, earlier today. In doing this, this has surfaced for us a number of places where we could use your help in the academic world to help us really think about what are the right metrics and measures, some of which don't exist right now, and how do you collect that kind of uh, uh, that data. We want to make sure we're building on existing public-private efforts already um, and making sure we're doing good engagement. So. This is almost the precursor to, I hope you will see early drafts of an early childhood action plan that we'd love to get all of your feedback on. Are we heading in the right direction? So look for that in the next you know, weeks to month um, as we start to uh, think about this. And then it, I, we plan it to be a living document, but similar to the opioid action plan, no problems get solved with a piece of paper, with an action plan. It's all in the execution. It's all in the implementation of that. But I do think it helps us prioritize, coordinate, all pull in the same direction, and again, use our resources to the, to the best uh, they, they, they possibly can. So I would just leave you with the we need your help. I hope you engage in supporting that action plan and giving your feedback. Um, I think we need to work on, again, the, the, the things that I have felt lacking where I don't know where exactly we want to invest our next dollar are things like what are those interventions that really build resiliency for children and families? What, what type of, of intervention to build resiliency is matched up with a particular uh, type of child? We were talking about needing to really understand context and making sure we understand um, you know, where a child is, rural and urban, or um, as well as what are the individual factors that are going into that child's life 
and then matching that with the right intervention. We can't have a one size fits all, but how do we do that in a way that's scalable? And for us, I think we need a lot more research to match those interventions with the right population, right? Asthmatic kids is a perfect example. I know that for, for severe asthmatic kids, buying carpet makes sense, but we're not gonna buy carpet for every kid in Medicaid, no, right? We're, we've, we have to hone in on who is it that it makes a difference to improve their health, improve their well being, and have those metrics. And then the other part of it is actually having good metrics, right? So as I think about zero to five, and I was hearing about some of these great trauma-informed uh, work that you all are, are doing here and the metrics that you have for older kids, they don't translate as well to zero to five. And so do we have the, those um, metrics uh, that, that we can use to know, are we really moving the needle in terms of language uh, uh, um, acquisition or social emotional development and such and so those are places where I would love partnership with the with the academic community to really speed up what we could what we could do there's data that we could do there's there's piloting that we can support and, and things like that so a lot of really good work but those are the places where we've already identified gaps in what we know and what we hope to invest in in the future okay with that why don't I stop and I'd love to take some questions and chat about whatever this on your mind, and again, thanks for having me.